I want to welcome into this panel uh, Roxanne Brown. She is a vice president at the United Steelworkers Union, which is America's uh, North America's largest industrial union, as well as Kim Glass. Kim is the CEO of the National Council of Textile Organizations. These are companies that produce uh, textiles, fabric, and apparel here in the United States of America. Both of these colleagues are uh, deeply embedded uh, in manufacturing and what it will take to spur a recovery. Uh, I wanna first turn, in, turn to Roxanne uh, and ask her uh, kind of what has the pandemic's impact been on your membership? Uh, you know, particularly the membership that you have uh, in, in manufacturing, Roxanne. Hi, Scott. And I wanted to just, uh, before I uh, answer that question, just, just thank you and thank AAM for really putting together this important event. Also thank Senators Rubio, Hawley, Brown, and Baldwin um, for their leadership in this space. It, it's clear as a result of this crisis that we really need um, thoughtful and strong industrial policy. And I think a lot of the pieces that have been discussed in this, um, in this conference need to be incorporated in that policy. Uh, and it's clear that it needs to be done in a bipartisan way. Uh, the COVID crisis, I think for our union, really exposed what we have intimately known and seen for, for the last 40 plus years with the offshoring of jobs and the loss of industrial capacity. Uh, unfortunately now this crisis uh, highlighted the loss of key uh, sectors of our manufacturing economy that, that lend to saving Americans' lives. Um, and I think now we're at a point where uh, we really have to step away from the rhetoric that, that has surrounded the manufacturing sector in this country for so long, that has really frustrated our members for a very long time and really turned that rhetoric into action. But to specifically answer your question, our members and the products they make, they literally touch every segment of this economy. And I just scrolling across, I see a lot of our members are on this, uh, are on this Zoom call, but their products literally touch every segment of the economy from steel to tires, to paper, to, to oil, to pharmaceuticals. Um, and quite literally, because the economy has been so impacted, they've been impacted. And, uh, and you know, what we're seeing across the landscape is that there are some facilities um, you know, that, that may rebound and others that may not. So um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a very frustrating and, and dire time for, for a lot of manufacturing across the country. Thank you for that, Roxanne. Mm -hmm. uh, Kim, I wanted to ask you the same question. Since the pandemic hit, uh, and we've had obviously the public health emergency, the economic consequences, uh, what, what has it been like for uh, the, the folks who make uh, textiles, fabric, and uh, garments in America? To, to build off what Roxanne Brown from the United Steelworkers, and by the way, is a tremendous leader within that union, as well as wow. you, Scott, uh, and your strong commitment to American manufacturing, this period of time, it's hard to even quantify. Um, we are in about eight week eight weeks of this crisis. I've got idle capacity within the textile industry, even as the headlines are talking about some of the industry's profound efforts to making personal protective equipment. We have seen 90% of our orders at some of our facilities be canceled. Uh, and no real understanding of when the economy and consumer spending will come back online. Uh, just to ar further articulate this, uh, we are the largest consumer of U.S. cotton, and our cotton consumption is down 92% from last year. This has had a profound impact on our manufacturing sector, as well as other manufacturing sectors across the economy. And like any manufacturing industry, we're the first to feel uh, slippage in the American economy. 
and it's going to be a slow start to recover, even as the economy comes back online. So we need a robust manufacturing stimulus to help workers get back on the job. We need to provide certainty in the marketplace, and we need strong public policies to help industries like ours recover. And for the PPE that's now being made here in the United States by United Steelworkers, textile workers across this country, we need to ensure that we build those supply chains moving forward. Yeah, and, and Kim, I, I'm glad you raised that because I wanted to turn to that uh, next. And we received uh, several audience questions. Um, and I'm from uh, Dejanay Shaw, United of Steelworker Local 7600, um, uh, Janine Twig of Michigan, Robbie McKee of Ohio, uh, Gary Harvey of Steelworker Local 676, and others. Um, what has this crisis told us about the need to reshore these critical supply chains and jobs? And Kim, I'll ask you first, and then I'll ask Roxanne to weigh in on that as well. Well, as soon as the coronavirus really hit uh, the national headlines and you're watching nurses and doctors and hospital systems and governors uh, seeking personal protective equipment and recognizing our foreign supply chains, which have long been dominated by China in their subsidized industry, break down literally overnight. Uh, we immediately got calls from all of these systems and these government officials asking about what our industry could do. And parts of this supply chain have been long offshore, seeking the lowest price. But at what price is it to the people on the front lines in our hospitals and our workers and our communities? What price are we willing to pay? So our industry quickly pivoted. Uh, this is not like uh, turning on, you know, pushing a button. Uh, you really need to work very quickly in this kind of environment to create new supply chains from creating uh, face masks to gowns uh, to even testing kit swabs that our industry was able to pivot and respond. But these supply chains without careful thought and strategy moving forward will just evaporate. We need to think about the public policy needs long term to ensure that these supply chains remain on shore. Thank you, Kim. And Roxanne, I'd like you to expand on that because I know the steelworkers obviously represent manufacturing workers. They, they, they represent a surprising number of healthcare workers as well. And so you've seen both sides of this. I mean, from your perspective, um, what has this crisis told us about the, the need to reshore uh, critical medical supplies and other items uh, that are of uh, national health economic security interest, Roxanne? Scott, you're right. Our union, obviously, we're at our core manufacturing union, but we also represent about 50,000 uh, members in the healthcare sector. And, you know, I would say that our, our nation's response to this crisis was, was essentially like sending a soldier into war with no weapons. So our 50,000 healthcare workers that have been standing on the front lines during this crisis had to step into this crisis to fight it with no weapons. And those weapons were gloves and face masks and shields and gowns, um, uh, testing kits, you know, ventilators for hospitals. These are all of the things that we were so woefully unprepared to, pro to provide um, for, for them, but also for the American public. Um, and, you know, I think we're in a situation also where we're seeing opportunists take advantage of the moment. There are rampant stories of price gouging, and, and, and Kim could, could I'm, I'm sure, share many of these stories where you have instances where some of these supplies have gone up by as much as a thousand percent. In some cases, N95s that were 38 cents before the crisis are now six dollars. You know, so um, there's a lot that's happening in this crisis that's really exposing not just the woeful inadequacy of our supplies but also um, just the nefarious forces uh, in this country who are taking advantage of, 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 this, of this crisis. And, you know, I've watched Kim Glass, who's, who's actually one of my best friends, um, you know, try to weave together, no, no pun intended, uh, a supply chain in the textiles industry um, because there have been so many holes left by, by bad trade policies over the years. And thankfully, we have companies like American Roots and Maine that, 
have basically shifted their production to make masks and shields, but we need a lot more and we really need to rebuild our capacity. We've seeded for too long uh, jobs, technology, innovation, uh, and industrial capacity to other nations and, and that has to stop. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Kim. And I think you're right. We've kind of shifted from the arsenal of democracy to the arsenal of health, but a lot of this has been bootstrapping and pivoting and not part of a, a strategy. Um, I'm going to stick with you, uh, Roxanne. A, another bucket of questions from the audience. So we got dozens that were related to this, and that's about the role of China. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all four senators uh, obviously think that obviously U.S. policy plays a role in all of this, but, but so do the actions of the Chinese government uh, and, and its policies as well. As, as well. And uh, particularly uh, Howard Fraunberger, Matt, Maggie Miller, and a bunch of others ask questions like this. So, so what is the role uh, that the Chinese government has played in all of this? And also then, what is the way out of it? I mean, what, what's the right policy response uh, that, that you see? Honestly, um, and I'll, I think I'll take this question from a few different ways. China um, it has the Chinese government has been a problem uh, for a very long time for domestic industries uh, across the board, not just in the medical supply space. Um, our union uh, uh, for the last several years has been dealing with massive overcapacity from China across a series of product lines from, from steel to paper to chemicals and others. Uh, and the same in this space where China really, um, you know, had the market on on a lot of these medical supplies that were needed and they kept it, you know, for, for a long time as they were dealing with it and, and didn't, you know, send it out to the marketplace. And so you had, you know, uh, uh, you know, people here who really needed those products really scrambling uh, for, to, to, to actually get them. Um, but overall, I would say that the practices of China that have really been unfair and nefarious for quite some time have led to a situation where We've had so much loss across a lot of our domestic industries. Um, the overcapacity, as I've mentioned, the transshipment, as was mentioned uh, by one of the senators earlier, the subsidizing of their industries, as was mentioned by Senator Baldwin, where you have industries in China who get their energy costs paid for, um, uh, or they get a free building uh, to basically operate their, their um, production. All of these things, has unleveled the playing field for domestic industries across the board when it comes to China and the products that they produce. Um, and to address that problem won't be one single bullet. You know, you heard, I wrote down as, as the senators were speaking, at least six suggested policy measures. That's just a drop in the bucket of really what is necessary to uh, revitalize domestic manufacturing and to get at the problem of China. It's making sure that we are advancing by American policies, as has been said many, many, many times on this call. It's making sure that we are making investments in infrastructure. It's making sure that we're strengthening our trade laws. There's, there's so much that needs to be built into strong industrial policy to really uh, turn our economy around in a way that needs to be done uh, that hasn't been done yet. Roxanne, thank you for that. Um, uh, back to Kim for a, a question, because one of the policy responses uh, for, for business relief has been with respect to tariffs. You know, there are a variety of tariffs that have been imposed on imported products. Some have been there for a long time under what's called the most favored nation system. Mm -hmm. Some of them are there because of anti-dumping and countervailing duty orders or the Section 301 tariff action on China or the Section 232. Uh, sorry for all these acronyms and, and numbers this, this late in the conversation, but there's just a lot of, a lot of different programs that, that have tariffs out there. The, the, the retail community, the importers, really pushed for relief from these tariffs um, and, and to have a deferral of tariff payments. And uh, unfortunately, they got their way. It was something that a lot of members of Congress advocated for. Uh, I don't think any of the four, sitting sen four senators we had on today did, uh, but the Trump administration approved this in April. And so what kind of impact does this have on domestic industry or what message does this send, Kim? 
You know, the importing and retailing community have been strongly advocating with leaders on Capitol Hill and within the administration about tariff deferrals and waivers and they need liquidity. These are the very same retailers who have offshored uh, our industry. Uh, I can drive down uh, to some of the, the counties of North Carolina and see shuttered mills. And I often wonder why the solution to their liquidity problems has to run through our manufacturing sector. The conversation needs to be about how do we invest in the companies and the workers in the United States of America, not what is the relief package to give to the importing and retailing community that have offshored these industries and now we're paying a price, including on personal protective equipment. So moving forward, we as an industry, we need tariffs. We have a price sensitive industry. Um, there's a reason that tariffs are in place because when we are negotiating with our free trade agreement partners, we need to raise the standards for uh, wages and for environmental uh, issues. And so tariffs are part of that negotiating package for market access in order to help level the playing field. And we can agree or disagree on how free trade agreements have been structured in the past and have that they provided equal opportunity for US workers. But that being said, it is critically important that we turn this conversation to what do we do to ensure U.S. manufacturers uh, recover. And there's many, many policies, including uh, a strong Buy American policy for our industry, which would include expanding the Berry Amendment requirements for all personal pr protective equipment made of textile to be fiber, yarn, fabric, and cut and sewn here in the United States of America. We need to be rewarding this industry and our workers and putting people back on the job. Yeah, I completely agree. And it sounds like, Kim, with what you have said there that, and what, what Roxanne said, and, and I agree, there's like six or seven sen things that the senators pointed out, but there is a framework for a policy there that, that's more than tactics, that's a strategy, as, as Senator Rubio suggested, but includes procurement policy, uh, a look at the impact that tax policy has on offshoring, uh, something with respect to currency, uh, clearly cracking down on the unfair trade practices, um, and, and, and being much more aggressive about that. It seems like there's a suite of policies that, that, could, be help, that could be helpful. And so I want to I pose a final question to both of you, and I'm going to start with Kim, and then I'll give Roxanne the last word here. You, know, you both represent workers and businesses that have been making things in this country for, for literally for generations, for generations. Um, and I think it's very fair to say that there isn't a single one of those jobs that's not at risk now. Um, and it's at risk for a variety of reasons. One is obviously we're in, a, we're in an unprecedented economic downturn. The other is that we still do have this massive manufacturing trade imbalance and our policy response still hasn't got it right. And so, you know, we're approaching election season and we are nonpartisan, but there's going to be lots of politicians from both parties who are going to want to go out and put on that hard hat and wrap themselves in the flag and say, I'm for American manufacturing. So what does that have to mean? What, Kim, what does that have to, to mean um, uh, for, for, for you and, and your members? And then I will turn to Roxanne. You know, uh, we heard from various congressional leaders today from both sides of the aisle who are committed uh, in a way that is across party lines on how to rebuild our industrial base. And we may all have different solutions to doing that, but we need to uh, evaluate our work here in Washington, D.C. in terms of the progress that we're making in real people's lives. When people come to our facilities, we're thrilled. It's an opportunity for us to showcase our workers, the products, uh, the level of investment happening here in the United States and the innovation in the industry. And we hope, and oftentimes after they visit our companies, they come back to Washington better informed on how to make policy and try to advance that policy moving forward. But we can't have Washington gridlock. 
this is a different moment in time. We need to come together to figure out how do we get our economy back on track. And that is the litmus test uh, for our industry. We're gonna be looking at what Congress uh, and the administration look to advance to help our industry recover. Uh, and then this is such a critical time. Kim, thank you for that. Roxanne? And I would just say that uh, we're going to be looking to make sure that we don't go back to business as usual. And that business as usual is not the standard for which, you know, whoever um, wants to achieve. Um, you know, as I think you said, Scott, before this crisis, manufacturing was in a really dire place in this country. And this crisis has only served to exacerbate it. So where we were before is not acceptable to our union. It's not acceptable to our members. We, we want more and we're, we're, de we're going to demand more. We are demanding more. And you know, a big part of that certainly rests with strengthening our trade laws. As, as we mentioned, you know, our union unfortunately has a very uh, long history of, of joining and bringing cases at the International Trade Commission because there's this hodgepodge of getting at you know, unfair trade that's not cohesive. So we need to have a really strong kind of long-term way of getting at our trade policy that is more sustainable for our industries. Um, it's making sure, as I mentioned, that we are ramp ramping up and strengthening domestic procurement by America policies. And it's, it's really making sure that we are investing in infrastructure. You know, right now there are about, you know, 39 million uh, jobless claims that have been filed in the country. So there are a lot of manufacturing workers who are out of work right now. And we know that we need trillions of dollars in investment in our infrastructure. This, this week, we saw a huge failure in Midland, in Midland Michigan with the dams uh, that failed, uh, one which was 100 years old. And Dow Chemical is in Midland, Michigan. 700 steelworker members are in Midland, Michigan. 10,000 uh, residents of that town were impacted because the infrastructure failed. You know, we're at a time we're all working from home or, or you know, kids are, are doing school from home. We have almost 160 million people in this country who don't have access to, to broadband. We have 2 million people in this country who don't have access to clean water at a time when everyone is saying, wash your hands, right? So, you know, there's so much that can be done in the way of upgrading and repairing our infrastructure that can be built into a broad industrial policy. And these are the types of things that we're not hoping to see. It's, it's the types of things that we are expecting to see as we move forward. And so, um, you know, we, we stand ready to fight and, and, and to get this done. Thank you for that, Roxanne and Kim.